glorious devotees, thank you so much for tuning in to another installment of Discourse on Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's Sri Madhuri Kadambani, the monsoon cloud of sweetness. We will continue on a subject we began in the last installment. Material desires are not absolute obstacles. Even if lusty desires continue to exist, if someone practices devotion, Vishwanath quotes a verse from the Bhagavad Gita, wherein Krishna says, Apichat su durachiro, budgete mam ananyabak, sador eva sa mantavya, samyag vyava sito hisa. Even if a man of abominable character engages in ananyabhajan, exclusive devotion to me, he is still to be considered a sadhu because his intelligence is firmly fixed in bhakti to me. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti himself in his Saartha Varsini commentary to the Bhagavad Gita gives the following comments in regards to this verse. Krishna speaks this verse to reveal that his affection for his devotees is natural and spontaneous and does not go away even if a devotee commits very sinful acts. Instead of abandoning such a devotee, Krishna even elevates him. If one should ask what kind of devotees are eligible for such treatment, the Lord says, one who worships me with undivided commitment, Ananyabak. This means they do not worship any other gods, nor take shelter of karma, jnana, or any other path but bhakti, nor desire anything other than Krishna. Such a devotee is considered a sadhu, even if he habitually engages in violent acts, has illicit sex, or steals. The word mantavya has an imperative sense, which means that one must consider him saintly. As this is the Lord's direct order, non-acceptance of it is offensive. There is hence no room for doubt as to whether or how one can be a sadhu and yet commit such sinful acts. The reason that he is still to be considered a sadhu is that his fundamental intentions are correct, samyag vyavasita. This means that he thinks, I will never give up the exclusive devotion of the Lord, even though I may have to go to hell or take an animal life for my sinful habits, which I find so difficult to give up. Since this intention is glorious, one should recognize him for that alone. Thomas Merton says the following, Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. So this commentary by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is quite profound. We should not mistakenly think this Gita verse condones sinful acts. Rather, it glorifies exclusive Ananyabhak devotion. Pichet sudurachiro pajate mam Ananyabhak sador eva samantavya samya vyava sito hisa. It is generally impossible for evil desires to exist within the heart of one with such exclusive devotion. The word api stresses the very accidental or aberrant nature of such an act on the part of a devotee. Such sinful tendencies cannot last for long due to Bhakti Devi's immense power. See Pram Bhavati Dharma Sasvach Chantim 
nigachiti kanteya pratijanihi name bhakta pranashyati. He quickly becomes virtuous and attains eternal peace. O Kanteya, boldly proclaim that my devotee never perishes. It is very important that we take into account the link between these two verses of the Bhagavad Gita. The very presence of devotion burns the devotee's heart in the fire of repentance and very quickly purifies it. Without proper understanding of these two verses and their interrelation, one may deliberately commit sinful acts on the strength of the verse Apichet Su Duracharo, thinking there is no need to repent for their acts. Such thinking, of course, itself becomes offensive to the holy name. The offense of committing sinful acts on the strength of chanting. Even though a devotee may commit serious evil acts, he is neither condemned nor is he forbidden the practice of devotion. Vishwanath further clarifies this by quoting Krishna's instruction to Uddhava. Even though my devotee may be obstructed by the sense objects and unable to control his senses, he is never completely overwhelmed due to the great power of devotion. By contrast, the jnani who commits even a slight unworthy act is considered fallen from the stage of gnosis. One who has not controlled the six forms of illusion whose intelligence is extremely attached to material things, who is bereft of knowledge and detachment, who adopts the sannyas order of life to make a living, who denies the demigods, his own self and the Lord, thus ruining all religious principles, and who is still infected by materialism, is deviated and lost both in this life and the next. Another interesting point to take note of. Notice that the messengers of Vishnu describe Ajamil as a devotee in the Bhagavatam. Ajamil uttered the name of the Lord, though he was calling his son's name out of affection. Although Ajamil and others were engaged in nothing more than facsimiles of devotion, they were still praised by everyone as devotees. Even when a sinful person has some superficial contact with devotional practices, Bhakti Abbas, such a person is considered a devotee. Ajamil is thus glorified by all the saints and scriptures. Any practice, karm, jnana, yoga, that depends on the help of external factors or is obstructed by obstacles to not be considered fully independent. Bhakti is so powerful, however, that even purity of heart is unnecessary, since chanting and hearing are possible when the heart is impure. Even when a sinful person has only had superficial contact with devotional practices, Bhakti Abbas, such people are still to be considered devotees. Bhakti is so powerful that even purity of heart is unnecessary since chanting and hearing are possible while the heart is still impure. We'll now go on to the next subject. Jnana load never leads to bhakti. Vishwanath writes in his Maturya Kadamani, Only the ignorant say that bhakti can be perfected through the practice of jnana. For the scriptures clearly establish that bhakti is superior to even mukti, 
the ultimate goal of Gyan. The Bhagavatam clearly establishes that bhakti is superior to even mukti, the ultimate goal of jnana, as confirmed in the following verses. O King Parikshit, for all you Pandavas, as for the Yadus, Lord Krishna, Makunda, is master, teacher, worshipable deity, affectionate friend, and head of the clan. Sometimes he even acts as your servant or messenger for your clan. In this way, he has put himself under the control of his devotees. The Lord will easily grant liberation, but not bhava bhakti. Here we see that Sukadev Goswami is encouraging Maharaj Parikshit, pointing out that he and his family are all great devotees of the Lord and that devotion alone places them in an extremely exalted position, a position that is equal to the Lord's own family members, the Yadus. And also pointing out that the Lord easily grants liberation, but he seldom grants Prem Bhakti. Hence his name is Makunda. But Maharaj Parikshit and his family members and the Yadus, they all were situated in Prem Bhakti or a loving relationship with Lord Krishna. Another verse from the Bhagavatam. O great sage, greater than those who are Jivan Mukta and greater than those who attain liberation, is the devotee of Lord Narayan. Such a devotee who is in Santa or other Rasas is very rare, even among 10 million people. So the question is, does Gyan or intellectual insight nourish devotion? Some proclaim that Gyan nourishes bhakti and that without intellectual insight into the nature of the individual and supreme self, it is not possible to engage in devotion. The following discussion will show that actually the reverse is true. In Gyan we have three categories of knowledge. So we have the famous Mahavakya of the Skandogya Upanishad, Tat Twamasi, Thou Art That. In this discourse, we'll be looking at this Mahavakya from the personalist viewpoint. So first we have the Tat Padartha, the That Principle, That meaning everything else. The Twam Padartha, the Thou Principle, meaning ourselves, our individual consciousness. And a C, the relation between the two. Let's look a little more deeply at this. Again, from the perspective of Achinta Beta Beta Tattva, as is the standard of our Gaudiya tradition and taught by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. Tat Padartha, the that principle. The Tat Padartha, everything that is not of finite consciousness. In other words, everything that's not limited in consciousness is what is called according to the Mahavakya, tat. So tat twam asi. And of course, our understanding of tat, the that is the supreme, the supreme absolute truth, Lord Sri Krishna. Knowledge that that supreme absolute truth has a form, he has an eternal blissful nature, Satchitananda. 
full of all knowledge. He is the original personality of Godhead. From the Gaudiya tradition, we accept the Pareva Sutra of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam. Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. He is the embodiment of all Rasas, Rasa Raj, and he has infinite beauty, sweetness, qualities, and pastimes, along with his eternal associates and knowledge of his Swarup and Maya Shaktis. His internal and external potencies. The Twam Padartha, knowledge of Twam, the Thou principle, uh, refers to the fragmental particle of spirit soul, the Jiva. The Jiva is a part and parcel of that supreme absolute truth. The jiva is a marginal potency, also referred to as Tatasta Shakti of the Supreme Lord. It is Vibhim Namsa, a separated part, uh, simultaneously one with and different from uh, the Supreme Absolute Truth, Lord Krishna. That infinitesimal spiritual spark is itself eternal in nature. It has subordinate independence and minute free will. The relation between the two, a C, Sri Krishna is the master and the Jiva is his eternal servant. Krishna is all pervading and the Jiva is minute. Krishna is the master of Maya, but the Jiva can be controlled by Maya. Forgetfulness of Krishna's lotus feet is the cause of the Jiva's bondage. Remembrance of Krishna is the cause of the Jiva's liberation. That concludes this installment of Madhurya Kadambani. The Monsoon Clouds of Sweetness, as presented by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. I thank you so much for taking your valuable time to view this presentation and hope you will come back again to future presentations. Hare Krishna.